our sixth annual luncheon briefing on the election of candidates for the United Nations Human Rights Council. My name is Hillel Neuer. I'm the executive director of UN Watch. And I'm going to speak for a few minutes to present our report today and to uh, say a few words about our observations on the workings of the Council in Geneva. Our organization, UN Watch, is based in Geneva, Switzerland. And we have the privilege, if you want to call it that, to uh, live. My colleague, Leon Saltiel, our deputy director, has flown in, in with, with me from Geneva. We have the privilege to have been for almost the, most of the past decade uh, living at the Human Rights Council and in its former, its predecessor, the now defunct Commission on Human Rights. And uh, we're trying to make it work, and, and it's a struggle. Um, I want to welcome distinguished ambassadors, representatives from the diplomatic corps, some from Geneva and from New York, who are with us here today. Uh, and I also want to welcome uh, friends and supporters of UN Watch who are here with us and of Human Rights Foundation. We're so honored and pleased that you're able to join us in this important event. And of course, our eminent champions of human rights uh, who will be introduced uh, more fully by my colleague Thor Halverson, president of the Human Rights Foundation, momentarily. But I'll just uh, mention their names, Ali Al Ahmed at the Gulf Affairs Institute, and Masha Gessen, author, journalist, activist from Russia, and Chen Guang Cheng, and Yang Jian Li, former political prisoners, human rights activists, dissidents from China, and of course, Rosa Maria Paya of Cuba. And as I said, Thor will, will say some some substantial words about them in, in a moment. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, briefly give an overview of the report that is before you today. And, uh, and when Thor and I are both finished our remarks, you'll have a chance to uh, ask any questions that you may have. Uh, and of course, after the event, uh, I'll be here and Thor, you'll be here as well uh, after the event and available for, for questions. I might leave or I might stay. I don't know. OK. Maybe I'll stay. Maybe Thor will stay. Um, so a few words about the report. Next week, on November 12th, will be the annual election for approximately one-third of the Human Rights Council seats. As you may know, there are 47 countries that get to sit on the Human Rights Council out of 193 total at the UN. And every year, approximately one-third come off and one-third uh, are elected for three-year terms. This year we have 17 countries that have formally submitted candidacies and uh, they're listed before you here and only 14 will be chosen. There's competition in some of the regional groups but in some, and it's one of, the, uh, one of our criticisms, is that both in the Eastern and the Western European groups there's no, no competition and that runs contrary to the entire premise of having elections if there's no competition in the regional group. It doesn't mean they necessarily have to be elected but de facto that tends to be what happens. Each country ticks off the candidates that are before them, and, and especially if there's no uh, competition. Now, the, when the Human Rights Council was created in 2006, the, by the UN General Assembly resolution in March 2006, 60-251, the General Assembly made a very important decision. When you meet people and talk about the Human Rights Council, people like to have an intellectual debate. Should we only have a club of the good and the democratic and so forth, or should it be open to everyone and to be a large tent and include people and have a dialogue? Well, guess what? That debate raged in Geneva and New York, but it was decided. The UN General Dis Assembly decided in that resolution in March 2006 that members shall be those who have a record of promoting and protecting human rights, and, and the, the decision was made. So, what we did is we examined the candidates based on the UN's own criteria, whether these countries promote and protect human rights. And to do so, we looked at two key factors. Number one, what is the human rights record at home in each of these countries? How do these governments treat their own citizens, free speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, and so forth? And equally as important, what do these countries tend to do when they vote at the UN? Every one of these countries votes at the UN General Assembly and we have a record, and we know how they vote, and we know how they vote on human rights resolutions. And so a country may have an excellent record on protecting human rights at home, but for various ideological, realpolitik, political reasons, they may belong to regional groups at the UN that have a policy of voting contrary to resolutions that actually promote human rights. 
Now let's walk through uh, the candidates and our ratings. So the first group are not qualified. This, if you will, is our list of shame. Uh, not every country is the same, but each of these had abysmal records when it comes to human rights protection at home and to uh, voting for or against uh, resolutions that promote human rights at the United Nations. And these are Algeria, China, Cuba, Jordan, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Vietnam. Now, four countries in particular stood out, and those are the countries about whom our dissidents will be speaking today. And the details on their human rights record, we've summed them up in our report, both on how they uh, treat their own citizens and on how they vote at the United Nations. Uh, and you'll see, for example, a country like China, when there were positive resolutions here in the General Assembly, as there are every year, uh, usually, uh, there was resolutions on North Korea and Myanmar. China, China voted against them. There were resolutions to speak out for victims in Syria and Iran. China voted against these resolutions. There were counterproductive resolutions. The Human Rights Council adopts a number of resolutions that are either sponsored or supported by Cuba, Syria, Iran, which if you read the titles, they seem very positive, but if you actually understand their purpose, you understand that they're, they're designed to undermine the human rights system. I'll give you one example. Human rights and cultural diversity. Who could be against human rights and cultural diversity? Not me. But if you actually read the text and understand the context, it turns out that this resolution does not promote cultural diversity for individuals, for example, uh, the Shia minority in Saudi Arabia, or the Baha'is in Iran, or the Uyghurs in China. That's not what these resolutions support. They support cultural diversity for the regimes. It's a shield for the regimes to say, you can't criticize us with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We do things differently. You do things your way. Well, in Zimbabwe, and China, and Iran, and Saudi Arabia, we do things our way. So cultural diversity is not for the victims. It's for the regimes. And not surprisingly, Iran recently created a center for human rights and cultural diversity, which is nothing but a propaganda vehicle uh, to attack Western democracies and to promote uh, the political interests of Iran. So that's an example of counterproductive resolutions. And of course, uh, uh, Cuba is often at the lead in promoting these re resolutions. And China, of course, voted for them. There were also resolutions for uh, victims in Belarus and China voted against that, uh, as well as Sri Lanka. So China's record is abysmal. And the other countries that we'll be addressing today have basically the same kind of records in the, in the not qualified category. Uh, each one a little bit different, but essentially the same. The next category of countries is questionable. Uh, those we have here listed Maldives, Morocco, Namibia, South Africa, South Sudan, and Uruguay. And to summarize, we have countries that have poor human rights records. These would be Maldives, Morocco, South Sudan, some poor, some very poor. However, uh, these are not in the same category as the first group. They are not as systematically active in undermining human rights. They don't necessarily take leadership roles. And in their UN voting records, each one has uh, various positive elements. They have mixed voting records. And so while we've documented, and that's in the addendum, the review of questionable candidacies, we've documented the serious human rights abuses by each of these countries. At the same time, we took note and recognized that, for example, Morocco supported positive resolutions on North Korea and Syria, and the same for some of those other countries. And so we didn't necessarily put them in that final category, but to be qualified, they need to address the very serious human rights abuses that we document. And then the second part in this category are countries that are ranked as free. Freedom House ranks Namibia, South Africa, and Uruguay as free. However, that's not enough. You can be free, a free country, but at the UN, vote the wrong way. Sadly, South Africa, a great democracy, great hope for the future, uh, votes negatively at the United Nations, uh, whether it's on Iran or, or a range of other issues. And, and this is vital if we want to elect it to the Human Rights Council. Uh, the final category are four countries that are qualified, um, and uh, one of them, Mexico, we've uh, added a, uh, a comment in the end of the report explaining some of the complexities given violence surrounding the drug trade and how that is evaluated. So that, in essence, is the report before you. Uh, Thor may have some additional words on it, and if you have questions, we'll be happy to take it later. Um, in just a, a few minutes, I want to say a, a word about the uh, performance of the Human Rights Council. As I mentioned, the Human Rights Commission 
Uh, Kofi Annan said that it was rife with politicization and selectivity in 2005. As you know, in 2003, Colonel Gaddafi's regime, Libya, was elected chair of the regime, right? So 1946, Eleanor Roosevelt was the founding chair. 2003, it was Colonel Gaddafi's Libyan dictatorship. And uh, this was kind of the death knell for the commission. Kofi Annan said, we need something new. We need to have members committed to human rights. And here we are seven years later. How, have, how has the new council performed? And I think the answer is, is mixed with some serious uh, regression. Um, the, the, the mixed element is that there are, have been a handful of resolutions on worst abusers, such as uh, uh, Sri Lanka and Iran, kind of a mild resolution, but nevertheless, we have a rapporteur resolution on North Korea. We had an inquiry on Libya after the war, not before, because Gaddafi was reelected to the council in 2010. But we've had a number of positive resolutions, thanks to the US, Canada, Western Europe, and I acknowledge the Canadian ambassador who's here with us for the uh, very uh, constructive role that Canada continues to play in supporting human rights, and we saw that last week when China was reviewed. Human rights activists uh, all agree that Canada had the best statement on holding China to account. And we also have a representative here from the Czech Republic who's taken a very principled stance on a range of issues, and we encourage your countries to t keep uh, taking the, the brave stand that you do. I know it's not easy, and you often pay a political price, so uh, our hats are off to you. Uh, on this issue. So we've had a number of positive resolutions, but really they're the exception. The vast majority of the world's worst abusers continue to go ignored. There has never been a resolution in seven years of the council on the countries that we're gonna hear about today, China, Cuba, Russia, Saudi, nothing. No one even introduces them. In the old commission, there was a resolution once on Russia. China, every couple of years, the US or the EU would introduce one. Now they don't even bother to introduce. When I mentioned it to one diplomat, he literally laughed at me. And uh, Yang Zhenli, I told you that. Uh, I, I said, mentioned that we, we pledged to, to work on your cause. Would you please introduce a resolution on China? This year, they're not a member. And he literally laughed. He said, no one is going to do it. So that's the reality. And, and it goes on. Egypt, we had a massacre. No resolution, no attempt. Pakistan, people are being blown up every day. No attempt. Zimbabwe, and so forth. So the vast majority get a free pass. We have the UPR, where every country gets reviewed. That mechanism has hope. However, uh, too often it's used as a mutual praise society. Two weeks ago when China and Saudi were, were being reviewed, China praised Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia praised China, and that was the vast majority of the statements. Not all, we had great statements by a number of countries as I just mentioned, but the majority were mutual praise and orchestrated. You could see the statements, they were orchestrated. Uh, the final category, as I said, we have resolutions put in by Cuba and Iran that undermine human rights. Uh, we had the election uh, last month of a man named Jean Ziegler, who is famous for having created the Muammar Gaddafi Human Rights Prize, a prize that he received himself in the year 2002. He lied about it. He was exposed on, on Swiss TV with video of him receiving the prize, and nevertheless, he was elected by two-thirds of the council. So this, unfortunately, is the record. It's mixed, but there are very serious shortcomings. And today, we are calling on primarily the United States Ambassador Samantha Power, the EU, Foreign Affairs Commissioner Catherine Ashton to speak out and take action. So far, these leaders of democratic forces of human rights at the United Nations have failed to say a word about the candidates that, that we're talking about today, and they need to speak up. And you know that we've, we've been able to, and, and, I'll, and I'll conclude in just a moment, uh, we've been able to, uh, we exposed the fact that Iran was running the summer and Iran immediately pulled out. Uh, we exposed the fact that Syria was running, uh, they've pulled out, and a year ago, Sudan was running, and thanks to Mia Farrow, we had a campaign with many NGOs, and Sudan pulled out. The sad part is that those fringe countries kind of justify the rest. Many say, okay, those fringe we'll work on, but all the others, we turn a blind eye. And we're here today to say, don't turn a blind eye. Uh, with that, I turn the floor over to my esteemed colleague, Thor Halverson, president of the Human Rights Foundation. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Thor Halverson. I'm president of the Human Rights Foundation. We're a New York-based organization. Um, and that's usually how we describe ourselves in the U.S., but given that we're at the U.N., I think it's actually kind of neat that Hillel is a Canadian living in Geneva focusing on human rights, and I'm a Venezuelan Norwegian living in New York doing the same thing. Um, the, the issue of why we're here, so often the theme and the emotion surrounding issues about the U.N. divide people into a camp, you know, 
one fringe about how the UN is bad or it's a terrible place or it's hypocritical or inconsistent and another group that is blindly following the UN as if everything the UN does or just adding the name UN is a it means that something is is is, is uh, credible and full of integrity and the reality is 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 both approaches are, are not entirely accurate the the truth remains that the United Nation the United Nations was founded on a brilliant and wonderful ideal, and that was never again to genocide, and that was never again to so many crimes against humanity that have occurred, and since the UN has, uh, has been founded, have continued to occur. Um, the criticisms uh, about the UN often become politicized, or they become about, well, we don't like that country, or we don't like that government. Um, what you have here in the gathering of the people we've, we've brought together are people who are consistent about these issues. It doesn't matter to us if the countries that we're criticizing are allies of Russia, allies of the United States, or allies of Cuba. If they're not allies of human rights, they shouldn't be on the UN Human Rights Council. It's as simple as that. So, you know, people, you know, the words Syria, Cuba, Iran tend to be emotionally charged in the human rights context because they're huge human rights abusers, but then people forget about some other countries like Bahrain, for instance, or uh, Saudi Arabia, because either they have too much money or they have great lobbyists. Um, and I will make the distinction between governments that are dictatorial and do not allow criticism from the inside and governments that are not dictatorial and do have human rights violations occur. And you can see the entire map of Europe or um, Northern America. Uh, the, the relativization between these issues is one that cannot go unnoticed. We cannot be um, here and be criticizing every country that's on the Human Rights Council. We would like to focus on those countries where the very people of those countries cannot criticize those countries in the public square. So given that we've, we've addressed that, I, I, I wanted to give you that context to show you where we're coming from and why this is actually important. Some people wash their hands and say, this doesn't matter, or the UN Human Rights Council, waste of time. It's hardly a waste of time. It is absolutely central. They're, they're, we're not gonna recreate the UN somewhere else. What we have to do is believe in this organization. We have to work and work very hard to make it consistent and principled and to not be hypocritical. And the UN Human Rights Council is a brilliant illustration of a kind of magical realism as soon as you walk into the UN. And uh, to describe, I mean, the countries that we're gonna describe today, Russia, Cuba, China, and Saudi Arabia, they're trying to, they present themselves as champions of human rights. And uh, Hillel very um, articulately put some of these examples and why they will have resolutions, for instance, on North Korea and Burma and not on any of the dictatorships that are currently on the UN Human Rights Council. The speakers that we have today, you know, they, many of them have very impressive bios um, or they've accomplished extraordinary things academically or from a public policy perspective um, or from an adventurous, you know, heroic perspective in terms of, you know, fleeing the most cruel dictatorship of the 20th century, China, um, right underneath their noses. That's, that's quite an extraordinary feat. But what they all have in common is that they have personally suffered what we are talking about now. They humanize this very struggle that, that we are trying to communicate to you, um, either because a family member of theirs has been murdered by the regime that they are here to raise a voice against, or because they have personally suffered circumstances, you know, in the case of Masha Gessen in Russia, um, a woman who refused to go along with the, the journalistic uh, practices of others uh, and refused to send a reporter to a, um, to a propaganda event and as a result of that had to bear the brunt of um, the cruelty of the Putin regime. I can tell you why this is important. It's not just that. Last year, Kazakhstan was elected to the UN Human Rights Council and we opposed their election very strongly. Kazakhstan is one of these countries that has spread so many, so much money around the world. You know, they hired Tony Blair as a consultant and they've poc he's pocketed more than $30 million by now from the dictatorship of Kazakhstan. Uh, recently, Kanye West got, got paid $3 million, again, from the pocket of the treasury of Kazakhstan to sing at the, at the Nazarbayev 
grandson's uh, marriage. Uh, a country that is so rich and has bought so many foreign politicians that it gets a pass a lot of the time. The moment they got elected, I'm going to read to you within hours of Kazakhstan's election to the UN Human Rights Council and why this matters. Um, here is the Hill newspaper in Washington, D.C. Their foreign minister writing about Kazakhstan's appointment to the UNHCR. Quote, we have put in place a comprehensive human rights plan to ensure guarantees under the Constitution are met. Forward a little further. Uh, we are ready to work with both domestic and international NGOs to deliver this aim just as we are determined to work to promote human rights internationally. Uh, this, this statement, you cannot fit more lies in that sentence because you just can't fit more lies into that sentence. Um, if you look at uh, this, is a, here's an expert opinion from Richard Weitz, PhD, a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. I, I'm wondering if the Hudson Institute has received copious amounts of funding from the Kazakh government or from some entity involving the Kazakh government. Quote, congratulations to Kazakhstan. It is a great opportunity to help raise global human rights standards in partnership with the United States and other countries. Um, this, I mean, I'm embarrassed for, for the people at the Jamestown Foundation and at the Hudson Institute. Because if this is their scholarship, it is very shallow scholarship. Um, I, I do note, by the way, that Hudson Institute is typically identified as a right of center think tank. Again, I could care less if it's right of center, left of center. If it's not down the line on human rights, it's an embarrassment and it should be pointed out. Um, here you have um, chairperson of the Kazakhstan Civil Alliance which really should be renamed the Kazakhstan Financed Entirely by the Government Civil Alliance. Uh, we're not only encouraged, but this is a result of those progressive steps taken by us in terms of the wide scope of actions toward human rights and freedoms in Kazakhstan. Um, the chairman of the Kazakhstan President's Human Rights Commission, this is on and on and on. So they get elected and they see the election as a badge of honor, as proof that, hey, we wouldn't be getting elected if we weren't doing a good job on human rights. So from that perspective, it gives them cover. And every time a journalist will ask a question or someone will put the president on a hot spot, they will say, but we're on the UN Human Rights Council and we're working within the mechanisms of the United Nations to blah, 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 blah. And you get that usual, like that white noise radio, you, you might as well tune out. So that's an example, and that's what every single one of these countries is going to do. But from a practical perspective, what does it actually mean? What it means is that they are now inside and they are sabotaging everything that can be done to point out or to investigate the human rights violations in their countries and to sabotage any attempt by anyone um, who is involved in investigating one of their allies. Cuba is the perfect, is the Rosetta Stone for how a small country can have massive, massive influence inside the United Nations. Look at it from a numbers perspective. They have one of the largest international delegations in the world. The tiny island of Cuba in New York has one of the largest delegations. And it uses this to basically trade votes and organize countries on every level. Cuba's out, suddenly Venezuela is in. And like this, they basically play, play it past the baton. I will help you, you will help me. Um, and what ends up happening is the very speakers we're about to hear from their voices are drowned out and their voices are censored. I can tell you this because last year I was a guest um, at the UN Human Rights Council to speak uh, about Venezuela's bid for a, a position uh, at the UN Human Rights Council. And I, I, I came to them not as someone who is um, running a human rights group, but I came to them because I have a personal situation being from Venezuela that I wanted to describe to them. The moment I used the word dictatorship. The delegate from Cuba immediately got up, started banging on the table so loud he kicked his own chair back and demanded that the speaker shut off my microphone. This is at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva in the, in the few hours, very few hours, that they allow civil society to come to the UN and have a voice. Um, after that, another country said, no, we should let him speak. Cuba said we should strike him from the record. China then brought up and said, no, he shouldn't be allowed to speak. Eventually, they said, OK, fine, you can finish your speech. As I was finishing, 
An, a, another time, I used the word dictatorial governments. Uh, suddenly, I had Russia, Pakistan, China, um, and Cuba all get up in unison. And it's essentially, it was like a circus. But they were the clowns. And our speakers today, um, they're here on good faith. They're here because they wish to leave the record. Chances are that these places will get elected and that it will be business as usual at the UN Human Rights Council. But they will leave behind this testimony that we hope that you will take with you and do something valuable with it. I'm not gonna go into detail about each one of these countries, but I am gonna say that the event is now going to shift into, um, I'm gonna tell you who they are. When they come up, they will speak. Once one of them is done, um, the, the next one will begin. And what I think we should do for the question and answers is rather than having one now between Hillel and me with, with you all, we should have all of us so we can have a more, dis a more discussion aimed um, event. Um, so with that, um, the first speaker, and you should all have a, um, should all have a, a, uh, a program. The first speaker is Yang Zhan Li. Um, his bio is, of course, uh, uh, not the first one. It's the penultimate one. Um, Yang Zhan Li and Cheng Wan Cheng will follow each other. They will both be focused on, on China. Ali Al Ahmed uh, will speak about his experiences, you know, starting as a child in Saudi Arabia and then going forward with regard to what he witnessed and what he has done uh, since then. Masha Gessen uh, will be talking about Putin. And Rosa Maria Paya will be talking about the murder of her father at the hands and under the orders of the Castro government. Uh, I'd like to invite Yang Zhan Li um, to come to the podium and begin. Once you're done, then, then immediately Cheng Wan Cheng will follow. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Distinguished guests, dear friends, good afternoon. At about 9 p.m. September 24th, I was on the phone with Miss Zhang Jing in China, the wife of the street vendor Xia Junfeng. Four years ago, Xia Junfeng, acting in self-defense, stabbed two para-police who are beating him and taking his things. She and their son had just had the last meeting with Mr. Xia Junfeng, who was that morning notified that he was to be executed the same day. She cried to me for help. At the same time, the online community was expressing outreach over the imminent execution. But no one could figure out how to save the life, which would be taken away in roughly an hour. I was in such a hurry to search for clues through the business cards of the parliamentary and the executive leaders of the world democracies. Although I knew it would be almost impossible for any of them to do anything about it. While it is debatable whether democracies should intervene with such controversial criminal cases as that of Xia Junfeng, it is totally unacceptable for them to withdraw from their responsibility to press China on its human rights record when an opportunity arises for them to do so with international lawful right and ca capacity without, be, without risking being uh, accused of interfering with the internal affairs. Such an opportunity will come up next Tuesday when the United Nations General Assembly vote to choose new members of its Human Rights Council. Before I continue, I want to emphasize the fact that I'm a citizen of China. 
As such, I'm speaking not as a foreigner to interfere with China's internal affairs. Rather, I'm voicing the concerns of a Chinese citizen, concerns that should be heard by the international community. If you will, I'm a, a citizen of China trying to interfere with the foreign affairs, but I'm not alone. In my hand is the copy of nearly 10,000 names that we collected from the Chinese, Tibetans, um, Uyghurs, and the Mongolians who urge the world democracies to cast a no vote on China. Today, China dungeons hold tens of thousands of Chinese, Tibetans, Uyghurs, and Mongolians, and Muslims, Christians, and Falun Gong practitioners, including Wang Bingzhang, his da whose daughter is here with us, Tiana, who briefly seek to defend the rights of those persecuted for faith, for their faith, ethnicity, or seeking the rule of law. The Tibetans today are still driven by desperation at their continued oppression to emulate themselves. Yet, China failed in the recent UPR to show any sincere commitment to addressing these repressive policies. Some people have or may maybe continue to hope uh, that the inclusion of China into the U UN Human Rights Council will behave it. But China's track record from when it previously served on the council is a notorious one. Thousands of instances of legal persecution, legal repression, happened from 2006 to 2012 when China was a member of the council, including the cases of Liu Xiaobo and his wife Liu Xia, Gao Zhisheng, Ai Weiwei, Qin Guangcheng, who is with us today, and Ha Da, a Mongolian, uh, Haret, Niaz, a Uyghur, and Dangdu, Wangcheng, a Tibetan, among many, many, many others. During that time, China became the only country detaining a Nobel laureate. And during that time, its field, economic, uh, its field ethnic policies led to a series of uh, deplorable incidents. There was, for example, uh, May, uh, March 14th incidents in Lhasa, July fifth incidents in Urumqi, and May 25th incidents in Inner Mongolia. And more than 100 Tibetans set themselves on fire. Just in most recent month, when China, while China was bidding to become a, a member again, it intensified the, its suppression of online freedom of speech and the citizen movement. It arrested and jailed about a couple of hundred activists in recent months. Therefore, voting to put China on the UN Human Rights Council would be like picking the fox to guard the hen house while he still wiping feathers off his mouth from his last meal. We know that any country, any candidate needs 97 votes at the UNGA to be elected to sit on the council. If each democracy says no, the chances for China will be zero. So this very vote actually tests every democratic government's uh, commitment to democracy and human rights. And therefore, we call 
all democracies not to humiliate, humiliate your great country and your great people and choose to cast a no vote on China. And after all, I just cannot imagine how could a democracy vote with a straight face to place China, the world leading human rights violator, on the body charged with protecting human rights. So I like intervening with Xia Junfeng's case, opposing China's candidacy to United Nations Human Rights Council is a kind of, the kind of clear step that is needed. This is, I believe this is the least the world democracies should and can do. Thank you, thank you very much. Hi, Dutai 专制国家来审议民主进步国家的人权状况，大家不觉得这很尴尬吗？ So if you allow such a authority with Victorian power to enter the committee, then isn't it very clear all of you will see how will this how it is like how will this help all of you will be clear? 对。他们进入这个联合国理事会的目的很显然不是去很好的推行人权，很好的按照这种啊公正的原则去对人权做出评判，目的就是要阻止其他的民主国家对他侵犯人权的这些行为啊去有一个机会去为自己。一个连联合国基本宪章国际人权公约都不遵守的这样一个政权，他加入联合国理事会来审议其他民主国家的人权，我觉得这是不可想象的。北京在一九九八年就已经签署了公民权利和政治权利国际公约，可是至今已经十五年了，却迟迟不去通过，能不能通过？我想大家都非常的清楚。那么，只要中共想通过，是非常非常容易的，把橡皮图章拿过来按上
all those who um, uh, who uphold democracy in their country, um, then they should uh, analyze this and think very clearly. 一个对自己的国民，对自己的衣食父母。都频频施暴的这样一个政权，他会对国际社会负责任吗？他会跟你其他国家真心的去交流，真心的去推心置腹的做真正的事情吗？我想这是不可能的。所以，我们这些民主国家应该携手建立起一个这样的人权联盟，在这个人权价值标准上有一个非常清晰的界限，要大家是不可逾越的。呃，就在今天早上，呃，我接到来自国内的一个电话，呃，就在我的家乡临沂，有一个因为这个一个妇女被中共当权者每天二十多个人现在就是说围困在家里，而这样的事情在临沂已经不是一家了。纵观全球，像中共独裁者这样每年花费超过国防开支啊七千多亿元的这个费用来对付自己国民的国家，恐怕是绝绝无仅有的。他侵犯人权的这些事例呢，可以说是举不胜举，每天都在批量的发生。啊，前几天二十八号的时候，对江西的刘平、魏忠平、李思华，对这种。以邪恶来审判正义的那种状态呢？他们竟然动用全国的维稳系统，把所有的这些呃维权人士全部都看在家里，或者是中途绑架，或者是被呃旅游等等各种形式控制起来，然后在江西开庭。在江西的那个新宇，新宇，李省信，呃，李思华、魏忠平、刘平。呃，魏荣平、李思华。魏荣平、李思华。刘平。刘平。哎呀。When they were sent on trial, uh, the entire nation, um, they they uh gather up, uh they they round up all the human rights uh activists. They picked at them all, uh, all kinds of ways and means to keep them under control. A trial was going on. 对，在这种情况下，他们任意的践踏法律，啊，完全用黑社会的手段来控制这个国家，来控制这个国家的国民。十月十六号的时候啊，他唐吉田律师因为为法轮功辩护而被这个六幺零办公室挟持着公安对他进行拘留。唐吉田，唐吉田律师，嗯。六幺零办公室对，呃，六幺零办公室挟持公安去拘留他。六幺零办公室本身呢是政法委的一个系统。这个大家，我我想对于这种独裁者控制人民的手段，可能尤其对中共应该清晰的认识啊。这个六幺零办公室是个什么东西啊？六幺零办公室是党委之下这个政法委里边的一个。特务机关用来专门
，为了对付当年的法轮功设立的。在国家政府系统当中没有这样一个编制，但是国家政府是被这个党挟持、绑架的，所以说他组建了这样很多类似于黑社会、类似于黑帮的机构来挟持着政府去做这种违法的事情。十月十七号的时候，枣庄的有一个叫苏世勤的知残人啊，他的右腿是假肢，就在北京大庭广众之下被他家乡的这个国宝，呃，公然的绑架，塞到一辆白色的面包车里，从北京绑架回枣庄啊，好长时间到现在我还没有听到下落。苏世勤，苏世勤，对。<咳> Was kidnapped in Beijing by the National Security and stopped into a white van, and until today, this person's whereabouts are known. When Beijing friends came to the place, then a police officer told them, "Oh, I heard that at early morning, there was a man shouting for help." 残疾的女的被五六个男的强行拖着塞进这辆汽车，然后就扬长而去。So, uh, 这样的行为比比皆是啊！面对于国际社会的呼吁，中共当权者装作听不见啊！你看我们现在的这个呃王炳章的事情，在全球引起了这么大的轰动，他装作听不见。但是在这儿呢，我要告诉朋友们，所做的任何一点，他都让他寝食难安。他只不过是担心，一旦他给人察觉他很在乎的时候，大家会做的更多，所以他装作听不见。所以。我们大家只要团结起来，向前推动，我相信肯定会收到非常有效的结果的。那这呢，就需要我们大家持续的去做，而不是一过性。在整个人类结束专制的这个过程中，可能这个中共独裁者是一个最后的一块硬骨头，希望我们大家一起来把它啃掉。好，谢谢大家。Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I wanted to thank uh, uh, Hilal, UN Watch, and other, and the Human Rights Foundation for inviting me today to speak. My name is Ali Al Ahmed. Uh, I, I was born in Saudi Arabia, and I'm a victim of the Saudi monarchy just like many thousands, tens of thousands of our people. I'm not alone, as I said. All members of my family have been, at one point, been arrested and jailed, including my parents, my younger sisters and brothers, my older sisters and brothers. 
my youngest brother, Kamil uh, Al Ahmed, is spending his 16th year behind bars in Saudi jails. With him is my nephew, Muhammad Abdullah Al Ahmed. My oldest brother, Abdullah, was arrested for a year and a half, tortured. Two of his sons, Muhammad, who's in jail now, university student, and his oldest son, also a university student at the time, was arrested. They were all tortured. I was arrested with my family, including my youngest brother, who's in jail now. When he was 10 years old, I was 14. I witnessed the torture and the death of torture of young man, 18-year-old Saud al-Hamad. My youngest brother was tortured one time during these years of imprisonment for six months every day. He basically, his life is over because he spent the best years of his life and he continued to do so behind bars. Over the last 30 years, many members of my family, extended families, friends, and people I knew from around the country have been arrested, jailed, and tortured, and some have been killed. In fact, two members of my family, my cousin, Salman al rahim and my father's cousins, Hassan al brahim were killed by Saudi forces, one outside his house and the other while driving home from work. The Saudi monarchy has been jailing, torturing, killing, and violating the human rights of the people of my country for over 80 years. I can tell you of thousands of cases of the tortured, the murdered, the deprived, the silenced, but this will take years. I'll tell you of three cases. The case of Dr. Muhammad al Gahtani, a university professor, graduated from Penn State University, spending 10 years in prison for forming a civil society and calling for an election. I can tell you of a friend of mine, the poet Adil Lubbad, who's been tortured every day. He's still in jail and facing 25 years in prison. For what? Writing some poems and a book. I can tell you of Mr. Ayad Al Ayad, a man from Qasim. His son, his eldest son, is in jail for 11 years with no trial or charge. When his Three other sons, the youngest uh, sons. Ayub was ten, is ten, 10 years old. A couple of weeks ago, they went to prison to ask to see their brother, to visit him, because they have not seen him in years. They were all arrested, including Ayub, who was 10 years old. I can tell you of the killing of the protesters at the hand of the Saudi death squads, including children. These squads, unfortunately, are trained by an American company. I can tell you thousands of intellectuals, writers, religious leaders, children, and many other women, men, who are banned from travel, work, school, and other basic rights. In fact, my passport was taken away when I tried to renew my passport at the Saudi Embassy in Washington. And I asked the consul, what is the charge, what is the law that is allowing you to take my passport? He couldn't say. Who is seizing my passport? Which department? He couldn't say. So I told him, I know, you're a bunch of criminals. Thieves act like this way. You're not a state. That's why you're doing this. Because you can't even give me a reason or a piece of paper. Today in my country, we have thousands of political prisoners packing the Saudi prisons. In fact, Saudi building Saudi prisons is the probably the fastest growing sector in Saudi Arabia. For no real crime, most of these people did not really do anything serious. But they are usually tortured for extended periods of time, not allowed a lawyer, obviously. And if sentenced, usually it's in a kangaroo court. Kangaroo court that does not meet any international standards. The Saudi courts are terrible, they're big evil, they're sectarian, and they do not use any modern standards of 
procedure. The Saudi monarchy, why is that? Because the Saudi monarchy is an absolute medieval monarchy. It's a monarchy of darkness. There are no free, there is no free press, no civil society, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, any basic right does not exist. Women in Saudi law are considered to be the property of their male guardians, the only country in the world to do so. The male master can allow, can prevent a woman from going to school, from having life-saving surgery, from getting an ID card, passport, travel, even leaving the home. Of course, education includes that. And many Saudis, in fact, have taken advantage by and prevent their doctors from going to school. The Saudi monarchy bans women from exercise. Sports are not allowed for women. Yet the International Olympic Committee violated its charter by allowing the Saudis to attend the Olympic uh, Games in London. And I worked on this case. I had no response from the English, from the British organizers or the AOC. It was total ignorance. The Saudi monarchy is a racist monarchy. Blacks who make up 10% of Saudi Arabia are not allowed to be diplomats, judges, senior officials, military officers. Black women are not even allowed to be a school principal. In fact, Saudi TV does not allow black women to be on camera because it's too shameful. Saudi, the Saudi monarchy is holding, this is very known, if you ask many Saudis, what is Saudi Arabia is called? It's the big prison. The Saudi monarchy is holding the millions of people in that country in, in big prison. Sometimes, if they don't want to put you in jail, they take away your right to travel because they make you, instead of the small prison, you go to the big prison, which is Saudi Arabia. Can you ma imagine keeping you in your country as a punishment. This is what the Saudis are doing. That's why they took away, took away my passport, and I don't have any passport today. Many of the world governments are helping the Saudi monarchy by voting them for the Human Rights Council. Supporting the Saudi monarchy's membership to the World Human Rights Council is supporting racism xenophobia, chauvinism, anti-Semitism, dictatorship, and oppression. This is the pure fact. So any country that supports a membership is participating in the oppression of our people. Sometimes I think they are doing this and saying nothing about the Saudi monarchy's policy because they do not value us as people. They value us as worthless creatures who do not deserve the basic dignities of a human right. And if you, those who vote for the Saudi monarchy, do not believe that, then show it. At least do not vote for them. At least do not support them. I think we must gain our rights by ourselves. But we ask of you, the civilized nations, the democratic nations, not to support an absolute monarchy that among its practices and teachings, teaching its millions of students that they should kill all the Jews and hate all the Christians and kill all those who do not agree with them religiously. Thank you again, and I hope we win this time. My name is Masha Gessen. I am from Moscow. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, I would like to talk about the crackdown that we're now living through. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go into any, any detail on the crackdown. Uh, there's plenty of it. 
but I will just talk about the major stages of the crackdown, where it began and where we're at now. Um, and this crackdown is a new uh, period in uh, Russian politics. The first five years of Vladimir Putin's rule from, 19, uh, from uh, 2000 till 2004 <laughs> were characterized by uh, a systematic destruction of public space. He took apart the electoral system, he took, uh, he took over the media, um, he restricted um, any kind of political conversation. Uh, the crackdown that we've been living through for nearly the last two years is significantly different. Now it is directed specifically at the people who resist this restriction of public space and who resist this destruction of the electoral system. Uh, it began on March 4th, 2012. Uh, this was the day that Vladimir Putin was elected to his third illegal unconstitutional term as president. And uh, on the same day, the members of the protest group Pussy Riot were arrested. They would later be sentenced to two years in prison for um, 40 seconds of peaceful protest in a Moscow church. They're still, uh, two of them are still serving their sentences. One of them has not been heard from for the last two weeks. We're all extremely worried about where she is and what has happened to her. Um, it, on May 6th, 2012, there was a large scale protest in Moscow to protest Putin's inauguration. Um, it was one in a series of many peaceful protests. Many people, including me, went there with their children. I was there with my two kids, uh, two of my three kids, one of whom was two months old at the time. The police um, broke their agreement with the demonstrators by suddenly creating a bottleneck along the parade route and inciting violence. Uh, a riot broke out. Uh, one of my children, who was fortunately safe, but uh, the older child, the 11-year-old, was caught in the violence for two hours while um, I was outside waiting for her. About 600 people were detained that day. The, uh, all of them were released one to a few days later. But later, 28 of those people, all of whom were ordinary, uh, uh, ordinary participants in the protest, were picked up again and now they're facing charges that range, uh, their potential sentences Actually, they're sent the sentences there, they are virtually guaranteed range from two years to 10 years for supposedly participating in mass violence. These people were very clearly chosen at random. These were not organizers of the protest. They were not leaders of the protest. Most of their names uh, are not known to anybody uh, outside their immediate circle of friends or family. Uh, this is a typical strategy of intimidation ordinary people, people are picked up instead of leaders. Uh, in June, a new law on public assembly was passed that gives the police and the judiciary almost unlimited powers in choosing the people that they prosecute and choosing the violations that they uh, prosecute for and gives local authorities extreme powers of restricting public assembly in their jurisdictions. In July of 2012, a law on foreign agents was passed. The law aims to paralyze the work of virtually any NGO that receives foreign funding and has to a large extent succeeded in doing so. In August, it, uh, two different laws on restricting information were passed. One uh, has had a severe impact on publishers, especially on publishers that pub uh, publish children's books. Uh, and the other has given a consumer authority the power to block any internet site uh, for, for any reason. Uh, just last week, the consumer authority used its power to block a news agency for publishing a uh, video that was uh, made by Pussy Riot. In September, amendments were made to the laws on espionage and high treason returning those laws to the wording that we had in the mid-1930s, um, which made it possible to arrest and convict anybody uh, of espionage or high treason for doing anything, and I'm not exaggerating. Um, in December, a uh, law was passed in response to legislation passed in the United States 
one of the provisions of this law has been very well publicized, but two other provisions are also extremely important. Uh, one, pr uh, the provision that most of you have probably heard about is an all-out ban on adoptions of Russian orphans by American citizens. Two other provisions, uh, one gives the Justice Ministry the power to summarily shut down any non-governmental organization that receives any amount of private or public U.S. funding. Uh, in the meanwhile, the, uh, the Russia also kicked out USAID, which was an essential funder of many uh, pro-democracy programs in Russia. Another provision bans people uh, who held both a Russian and a U.S. passport from running or being members of NGOs. That's people like me and uh, several other people who have been active uh, in the pro-democracy movement. In January, the parliament took up the um, ban on homosexual propaganda. Homosexual propaganda is defined as the distribution of information that can cause, I'm quoting, that can cause harm to the physical or spiritual development of children, including forming in them the erroneous impression of the social equality of traditional and non-traditional marital relations. What that means is this is the first Russian law that actually enshrines second-class citizenship, that actually makes it a crime to claim social equality. It makes it a crime for someone like me not to tell my children that we're worse than the family next door. Um, there has been, uh, among the results of this law, which was passed in June, have been, has been an extreme rise in anti-gay violence, both vigilante violence, street violence, organized for the cameras violence, um, and most recently pogroms, literal pogroms, of uh, gay or gay sympathetic organizations. There, have also, there has also been uh, what can only be described as mass firings of uh, teachers who are perceived to be gay or sympathetic to LGBT rights, school teachers. Um, in February and March, about 2,000 raids of non-governmental organizations were conducted throughout the country in connection with the foreign agents law. Uh, the work of most of these organizations was paralyzed for at least several months following those raids because of the paperwork they had to submit in connection with various legal proceedings. Some of them have been found to be in violation of the foreign agents law and have been fined heavily and shut down. In June, the ban on homosexual propaganda became law and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the parliament also instituted, instituted in four days, which is also illegal, uh, a ban on adoptions uh, by same-sex couples or couples uh, or any people from uh, countries where same-sex marriage is legal. Uh, as often happens with Russian laws, uh, though this law should not be retroactive, I, for one, was warned by my lawyer that it probably will be used retroactively and I should get my oldest adopted son out of the country, which I did. Um, th the other two children are biological. The head of the Committee on the Family in Parliament declared her intention to create a mechanism for removing children from same-sex families, period. Uh, and sure enough, in September, a bill to that effect was filed. Um, the bill has since been withdrawn uh, because of uh, very uh, vocal international reaction, but the bill's sponsor, who is a member of the ruling United, Nation, uh, United Russia Party, has promised that he will refile the bill once he corrects the language. Translated into uh, human language, that means after the Olympics, they will refile this law when they're not so concerned about the international reaction. Um, in September, the uh, Russia reached uh, the Russia's human rights violations reached beyond its borders into international waters. Uh, Russian Coast Guard uh, picked up 30 activists, uh, uh, 30 Greenpeace activists, on a ship in international waters, essentially kidnapping them. Uh, these are citizens of 18 different countries who have now been held in uh, detention in Russia for nearly two months. They were first charged with piracy which carries a sentence of up to 15 years under Russian law. Uh, piracy uh, presupposes the presence of a ship, so they should have been attacking a ship. There was no ship in the neighborhood of that ship that they were on, uh, so it's not clear. Uh, in fact, the only pirates in the area were the Russian border guard, 
who attacked the ship and then uh, proceeded to actually clean it out of uh, laptops and other personal belongings. So acting like classic pirates. Uh, after uh, the Netherlands, uh, whose flag the ship uh, flew, filed suit in the International Tribu Tribunal on the Law of the Seas, uh, Russia downgraded the charges to hooliganism. So now these people face nearly up to seven years in prison rather than 15 years. How they could have engaged in hooliganism in international waters uh, is an open question. But um, it, um, this is actually a very significant case, not, be, not just because it's so outrageous that they kidnapped people in international waters, but also because um, that week, Russia really demonstrated its attitude toward international enforcement bodies and toward international law. Uh, by, first of all, refusing to take part in the International Tribunal on the Law of the Seas, even though Russia is signatory to the convention that, that created the tribunal. The same week, Russia refused to carry out a, a decision of the European Court of Human Rights, which directed it to review uh, and, uh, the case of a, of a man serving a life sentence for murder that the European uh, Court of Human Rights believes he did not receive a fair uh, trial in, um, in, uh, in being sentenced for. The Russian Supreme Court said it looked at the case and it, it did not warrant being reviewed. Uh, and this is the kind of attitude that, that Russia is showing to international law, to international enforcement bodies, uh, imagining that Russia would be elected to an international body like the Human Rights Council seems outrageous. It also seems like a grave insult to the 70 people who are currently considered to be political prisoners who are in Russian jails. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rosa Maria Paya. I want to thank you all and of course to the organizers for the opportunity. On September 20, the Cuban government declared in the Human Rights Council the past September 20. In the Human Rights Council that they would not allow democracy in my country. They reject values of the democracies and they pretend to redefine them with a twisted principles in order to remain in the power forever. The Cuban mission declined all recommendations to stop political apartheid and to ensure fundamental freedoms among many rights sequestered for the Cuban people by the government. My father, Oswaldo Paya, is the founder of the Liberation Christian Movement. He won the Saharov Prize from the European Parliament, and he struggled peacefully for the recognition in the law and in the practice of the rights of all Cubans to have rights. He promoted a referendum known as the Varela Project, which has the support of more than 25,000 citizens, more than the requested by our constitution. 10 years later, the Cuban government still refused to answer this citizen call for a plebiscite, violating its own constitution. My father died last year, and it is known that cars from the Cuban state security were chasing him, and that his car was pushed out of the highway. World leaders have demanded an independent investigation after the contradictory version given by the Cuban government, whose UN mission refused to allow this investigation as requested during the last UPR. How come the Cuban government belong to the Human Rights Council when they systematically abuse 
those who demand real changes. When they do not allow any investigation of extrajudicial crimes in which they could be involved. How come the Cuban government belong to the Human Rights Council when they abolish university autonomy, religious freedom, freedom of movement, association and publication? While, while they took control of all mass media in a nation where the most part of the people doesn't know internet because it is not a right. When they don't respect property rights, not the right to a free economy, only to promote now a fake reform that doesn't guarantee the rights of Cuban government, not even the rights of the foreign investors. How come the Cuban government is in the Human Rights Council when their leaders transfer power dynastically? When during the last 64 years, there have never been free elections in Cuba. They have never been subject to an effective popular vote, thus being illegitimate to represent us. How come the Cuban government is in the Human Rights Council when they mock of the international community as they present themselves as a victims before UN while, while they traffic tons of weapons and explosives in a civil ship violating UN's resolution about North Korea and endangering many lives in the Panama Canal? How come the Cuban government is in the Human Rights Council when they are the same militaries that shoot thousands of Cubans from the beginning of the revolution, who promote armed movement in Latin America, who sank at the sea the tugboat 13 de Marzo, Lord, with, with women and children, who murdered four civil pilots from the Brothers to Rescue Organization in International Waters, who imprisoned and deported the most of the Varela project leaders, who mistreated the activists, activists of the ladies and wives, who threatened to death my father, my family, the member of the Liberation Christian Movement, and many other dissident leaders, who split apart most of the Cuban families with their intolerance. How can they belong to the Human Rights Council when it is the Cuban government the one that kidnapped our people's sovereignty? The presence in the Human Rights Council of the Chinese, the Russians, the Saudis, and the Cuban regimes is disappointing for the victims of repression and it sends a message of complicity from the international community. Cubans know that we are responsible to lead our country toward a democratic transition. But this is time for solidarity and democratic governments should not share seats with criminals. which behave with impunity since they are not suffering any consequence for their violations. These are defining moments for my nation. It is time to pressure the Cuban government to behave democratically or in defect, not to elect Cuba for the Human Rights Council in order to preserve the legitimacy of the United Nations. Against democracy, we know there are many economic and political interests. 
including those who defend a supposed stability over a real peace based on universal rights. It is difficult to ignore lobbies and the power behind lobbies, but to defend the values for which it was created, the Human Rights Council has two choices. One, to ignore that the sovereignty of Cuban people is kidnapped, or to defend the values that are the basis of the United Nations, claiming respect for the democratic demands of all Cubans, therefore defending citizen rights in all nations. God help us all. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. We're now going to enter into the um, question and answer period. So I think uh, the more efficient way of doing this is rather than having everyone come up here, especially because the podium is not large enough, um, they will be able to take the questions from where they're seated. We can do this very informally. And um, we have a microphone that will rove. Um, uh, so if you have questions, hit me right here. We can all hear you. Okay, Evelyn Leopold, journalist here. Um, first question, I was curious of the Saudi representative here, uh, if he could explain what this Security Council message is about, that they, they championed for two years, they tried to get a seat on the council, the sooner they got it, the sooner they resigned. Well, uh, given given the fact that we want to, I think okay, it'd be absolutely sure. great to do that, and and you can and people who want a one on one with any of the speakers, we can do that as well. Yeah. But I want to focus exactly on the Human Rights Council and on the vote itself. Okay. Um, the j just for the for the journalists who have looked at the report, as you can see, it, the the methodology is listed in the report, and uh, it is very comprehensive. The uh, one of the key engineers of the report, Javier El Elaje is standing right over there, and he can answer all the policy questions, although he's pointing at his phone. You're taking pictures. OK, great. OK, so uh, other questions? I'm sorry? Yes, yes, yes. Explain the. Actually, my colleague Leon can answer that question. Yeah, that's how the Economist magazine rates France itself. We're just reporting how the Economist ranks. The Economist has a report on democracy in the world. So they rank France as a pure democracy. So we just report what they found. It's a there are, yes, there are different reports. So for instance, you'll have here um, at the very top, it says uh, the FH rating, as in the Freedom House rating, the Economist rating, uh, the Freedom House Press Freedom rating, the RSF, Reporters Without Borders rating, the UN voting record, and their suitability for membership. So of course, yeah, 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 yeah. It shouldn't be too difficult. Um, Javier, there is a reference for where they can see these reports. They're all they're all very easy to find online. You can you can do it reasonably quickly. Although the, these reports are sometimes this thick, so so I mean, we, we can't like attach them. One important thing to note in the case of France is that its overall rating, what it does, is that it's a democracy, it's a liberal democracy. So in spite of it being ranked as a pure democracy by one of the indices, overall it's a, it's a democracy. So they are qualified. I mean, I think a much more interesting question is Uruguay, which is a free country, fully democratic, with full press freedom, has a satisfactory reputation according to Reporters Without Borders, but the UN voting record is mixed, and the suitability for membership as far as we are concerned is questionable. And, and why is it questionable? Because this is a country that praises the Castro regime on a constant basis, has not one word about the dictatorship uh, engaged in human rights violations, and as such would not actually be a, a suitable candidate for membership in an organization that is supposed to be um, uh, focused on, on human rights concerns. 
That was just a non sequitur to move us away from France. Okay. Um, anyone have any questions for Yang Zhang Li or Cheng Guan Cheng or Rosa Maria? Un unquestionably, that, the, that that does happen. There is uh, uh, an embargo that prevents the United States uh, government and certain entities inside the United States from engaging in trade with Cuba. This, of course, is propagandized falsely as, as if Cuba has an economic blockade um, and that Cuba is surrounded by ships and no one is allowed. You could get Serrano ham in Cuba. You could get French wine in Cuba. You could get Swiss cheese in Cuba. Uh, what you might not be able to get are products made in the United States with a massive list of exemptions. But the economic, uh, uh, but, but the embargo has been, has become for the Cuban government the number one excuse for why life is so bad for Cubans inside Cuba. Um, oh, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not taking a position on the embargo in, in favor or against, but I just want to uh, contextualize that and, and let Rosa Maria respond. Excellent. And, and to add to that, it, it is, uh, you know, one of the easiest things to figure out if a country is free or not is, can you leave? North Korea and Cuba are two shining examples of a place where you're not allowed to leave unless you have a lot of permission. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's an embargo on the Cuban people, as she very eloquently put, uh, with regard to their rights and freedoms. Um, but on the, on the question of U.S. policy in Cuba, I think it's a great debate to have, and one to have with all the facts at hand. I, I just want to add one other point that um, <clears throat> Cuba is, is almost in a category of its own because uh, unlike, you know, we've opposed, we've opposed, uh, for example, a country like Algeria, which is a very problematic human rights record and UN voting record. But Cuba, I, I cannot overstate how much Cuba takes a leadership position on counterproductive resolutions. And, and um, you know, th there was a rapporteur who was here last week named Alfred de Zayas, and he presented. And at some kind of a meeting, he talked about how some of the rapporteurs are created. And Cuba creates positions to put in their people. In the year 2000, they created the position for Jean Ziegler, the right to food, who then went to Cuba in 2007. After the Human Rights Council canceled the mandate on Cuba, Christine Chenet, wh with whom they never cooperated, Right after that, they invited Jean Ziegler, the expert on hunger. He went to Cuba, he said it's a model democracy, and there's video on the internet, you could see him, it's in a French documentary, saying how wonderful this country is. He refused to meet with dissidents, he did not meet with Rosa Maria, Maria Paya's late father, or any other dissidents, and his visit was then used uh, to legitimize the regime. Uh, Al Alfred de Zayas, a rapporteur, said last week how they created another position called democratic and international, equitable international order. The world is unfair, you gotta make it fair. They created it again for Jean Ziegler, but the Americans vetoed him, according to Desaius, and they gave him the position. Just mentioning these, that Cuba is engaged in a massive effort, very successful, as you said, they have a lot of support, certainly from the non-aligned movement. Um, many democracies oppose them on these things, um, but th their presence at the council is extremely destructive and they take a leadership role. Yes.
Yeah. The the uh, the news last week was that Israel had returned to the council. They were not there for about a year and a half, and uh, they came back, uh, I guess, last week to participate in the UPR report, which was originally scheduled for January. Israel had complained that they were singled out. There's a special agenda item on Israel, which Ban Ki Moon had condemned when it was instituted. Uh, Israel has complained that it's excluded from any regional group at the Human Rights Council. That's something Kofi Annan talked about numerous times. Um, and to answer your question on the regional group, uh, the regional group system is not simple. There are regional groups in different UN headquarters, such as here in New York, but that's not the same as Geneva or Vienna or Nairobi or, or even some other cities. So although Israel was admitted into the Western European group in the year 2000, it remained excluded, for example, in Geneva from the Human Rights Council. So today the Human Rights Council has five regional groups. Uh, Israel is effectively the only country that is excluded from any of those regional groups. Uh, Israel is asking to be permitted. It says it's not something that's granted as a prize or as a reward to anyone. It's as of right, and um, it has not happened yet. Israel, I, from what we read, expects that it will happen, but there's no certainty that that will happen. Israel does expect that, that in light of its return to the Council, um, according to news reports, uh, we saw two things mentioned. One, that European countries might not participate in the special agenda item a day on regarding Israel, and also that the Western European group uh, is, is expected to admit Israel, but there is no guarantee that that will take place. Um, over there. The election. Will be Could you state your name and who you're with? No, the United Nations General Assembly, all the, the full plenary of 193 countries chooses. Okay, yeah. So 193. Um, so there's no veto. So even if the U.S. and the EU is calling on, says no, that's 30 no votes. Um, is there any history in the uh, Human Rights Council or its predecessor for uh, a country that's slated to be elected by a regional group? Yeah. Um, historically, when there has been no competition in a regional group, uh, I'm not aware of any case where that country was not elected, even though we've taken pains to, to document exactly how a country need not, you need 97 affirmative votes to elect a country. Um, and even if there's two candidates for two seats, no voter is required to vote for that one of those candidates. And we've noted how that, and, and if that said, up until today, to the best of my knowledge, and Leon can correct me, but I'm, I'm, I think I'm 99% sure, whenever there's been what we call a closed slate, two candidates for two seats, they've won. So now, for example, the Eastern European group is that situation, as in the Western European group, but we have no uh, candidates that we're opposing for those two seats. But in the, in the Eastern European group, yes, I will say to you, the chances are extremely high that Russia will be elected. Uh, that is not the case with others. Saudi Arabia and their regional group, there is competition. And coming back to Evelyn, although you were not allowed to ask your question about the Security Council, there may be some reverberations. You know, There may be countries who are upset at the Saudi decision. To the, I, I don't think they've given formal notice yet. They announced that they wouldn't take it, but they might be you know, encouraged to come back, and they haven't given formal notice uh, uh, to the UN. Um, there may be countries who are upset at them for that. So they might lose some, some uh, support. And there is competition in their regional group. So too um, in, uh, in the African group. So, so in a place where there's competition, there has been. Actually, Venezuela in the first election in 2006 did not get elected. I think Iran may have run in 2006. There, there were a handful of countries when there was competition who were not elected. And then sometimes they also, uh, when they say they're going to be a candidate, they pull out when they realize that they might not actually win Syria. And uh, Iran. And, yeah. and, and Sudan yeah. are, are, are That's right. examples. And, and I must point out, you know, you're saying, are we really just here to just, you know, throw a line in the sand and... and, and try and yell at a train that is n not stopping to please stop. Well, there is the hope that we have, and we're sort of dreamers, that, that actually what, did, what would happen if suddenly people did not elect Russia? What, would that act, what message would that send? What would then happen inside Russia? What message would the international community be sending to the people living inside Russia, to name one example, or inside Cuba? 
So I mean, if we don't try these things, they're never going to occur. I mean, the whole idea behind this, this organization was to stop genocide from occurring. Unfortunately, its track record with regard to stopping genocide is really quite appalling, um, especially in the case of some genocides when the UN actually arranged the financing for the genocide, but I'm not here to talk about Rwanda. Um, so let, let me, let me uh, add to that. So you know, as we said, there, in some cases, there, there are situations where countries uh, either pulled out Sudan, Iran, and Syria are the notable ones. Uh, I doubt these countries a week before are going to pull out. There's little reason for them at this point to pull out. Um, and you asked, well, if they're going to get elected anyway, why are we asking the US and the EU to speak out? What can they do? There's no veto. And I think that's an excellent question. And uh, in my view, uh, we have to recognize what world we're in. You know, we asked before about the Security Council. That sends boots on the ground. It's war and peace. The Human Rights Council is not boots on the ground. They're not going to stop genocide the next day. They are, they are uh, the immediate consequence of a Human Rights Council decision is not concrete and tangible. And it's, it's, you're dealing in the world of symbols. Resolutions under international law are non-binding. And yet they carry enormous weight. Why are the oppressors of Rosa Maria's family and of Chen Guangcheng and Yang Jianli and of Masha Gessen and Ali Ahmed, why are they putting in so much effort, exposing themselves to ridicule by groups such as ours to be in the council? For them, the symbolism is very important. Internally as well as externally. I mean, there is a reason why you say, uh, with regard to the issue of uh, the economic embargo on Cuba by the US government, there's a reason why they have so much sympathy. Because they have delegations that spend all day, every day, visiting every other embassy and essentially creating, doing the propaganda job that they, that they, so, that they do so well and that has made them into an underdog uh, for the better part of what was until Castro let the other Castro take over, the longest serving dicta dictatorship on the planet. And, and, and I think that in, in this world of symbols, the certain countries carry weight. And, and although we're up against great powers at the UN, Russia and China are veto-wielding powers, Cuba through its leadership position in the non-alive mov movement, and Saudi Arabia through its vast oil wealth are enormously uh, strong powers. And yet we heard today from superpowers, moral superpowers, uh, from, from those four countries. And, and you, you know their, their stories, we didn't talk about them at length, but they're incredible stories that these people have been through, what they've done. And I think for the democratic countries, for them to speak out, because when Gaddafi was re-elected in 2010, we were here with Mohammed al jahmi whose brother Fatri was tortured uh, and killed, and we said, don't elect Gaddafi to the new council, and he was, and the US didn't say a word. And it makes a huge difference if the US and the EU will speak out in this world of symbols, even if Russia will be elected, if Catherine Ashton and Samantha Power will say it is wrong for these countries to be elected. You know, we had Sudan last year, ran for uh, ECOSOC and became a vice president of ECOSOC, the Economic and Social Council, which oversees several human rights committees at the UN that are significant, including the Women's Rights Commission. Sudan, wanted for genocide at the International Criminal Court, was elected with, I believe it was 176 votes. If you do the math, it means only 17 didn't vote for them. There's 28 countries in the EU. At least 11 EU countries did vote for Sudan. And who else was elected recently? Well, we had that again, where the EU uh, voted for, for another human rights abuser. For Saudi Arabia, the Security Council, same thing. So at least, and probably more if you factor in other votes, the fact that, that uh, maybe 15, half of the EU countries are voting for these people is terrible. And yeah, but the symbol, the symbol there that, that, that Hillel is pointing out is usually the symbol of the dollar sign. You'll find that that's typically what follows, whether it's Sudan oil, um, or Saudi Arabia oil, or Kazakhstan oil. Um, so, so this is, been, which is, but it, what is important is to hold up the mirror and shame these countries. Uh, and we are actually in a place where we can do so and not be arrested as soon as we leave the UN and never be seen again. So um, that's a key element of that as well. I think we're going to allow two more, and then we're going to, uh, gentlemen. Thank you. 
So I think for China to become a democracy, uh, it is something that will necessarily happen. And in fact, we are stepping uh, towards it uh, gradually. We're accelerating its speed. And so um, it is uh, obvious um, the Chinese uh, citizens um, uh, wanting to exercise their democratic rights. Uh, in the last uh, half year, um, there's a new uh, crackdown. And in this crackdown, uh, more than uh, 150 people were arrested and uh, numerous were detained. And even so, even this was so, um, all over the country still went when the trial happened. And um, so uh, this, even though uh, this uh, crackdown is severe, um, this uh, response is something that has never been seen before. want to make only 50, um, 80 films uh, documenting the human rights situation in China, uh, compared to if you make 180 films documenting the human rights situation in China, then of course uh, the change will be brought about uh, differently. So um, the, uh, as to rent, this depends on the uh, degree of the desire, the degree of um, uh, the desire uh, you, you want um, to see this change, and the number of people. Thank you very much. Thank so you. Uh, the last question, uh, Matt. Did you miss my comment on Uruguay? Did you? Were you in the bathroom when I? Well, Cuba, Belarus, Iran. I mean, uh, Uruguay hasn't met a resolution that it that it uh, uh, praising these places it doesn't like. Um, the government of Uruguay has been, as far as being a moral beacon, appalling. So, then I guess, I guess so that make, means that they're not qualified. It means we do not think that they should be on the council. So, so it's not really a judgment of their human rights record in the country so much as their, their voting record. That's, That's precisely record. right. I mean, there is. I mean, again, um, some of these countries shouldn't be on the council because of what they do to their own people which means that they will never be able to judge with principle any other country. But some of these countries may be, you know, let's suppose, for instance, that a Scandinavian country was um, talking wonders about a bunch of kleptocracies in Africa that regularly uh, uh, engage in uh, promotion of female genital mutilation or the, the, the uh, um, execution of homosexuals. Uh, they would not be qualified simply, oh, we're in Scandinavia, we don't violate anyone's rights here. Well, that doesn't mean that that, that makes you a moral beacon in that sense, so hell no. But is there a danger of kind of practice, uh, pra practice what I say and not what, or, or, you know, not actually what I do? I'm looking at like Macedonia and Mexico which have worse records actually in their own country. Even according there to is the a part. functional difference in the human rights discussion between a violation of human rights that results as a product of state policy and a violation of human rights that occurs as a crime uh, that is done outside uh, of, the, of the law. So if, if say, a governor in a, in a state in Mexico orders the murder of a handful of journalists or a union leader, and he knows he's ordering a murder, and it is a murder, he is engaging in crime. Um, he is doing so outside of the strictures of government, when, uh, which is very, very different to a country where engaging in that is actual state policy. 
So there is a, there is a huge difference. No, you're going to find very few countries in the world where there are no, actually, you will not find a country where there are no human rights violations, uh, but where, where corruption and abuse of power does not exist. It exists everywhere, um, everywhere. The, the question is, what happens once that corruption appears? Or is the state actually engaged in it as state policy or not? And this is where a lot of people fail to see the difference between a dictatorship and a badly functioning um, crony capitalist democracy with regular elections, but where you still have individual rights um, overall. But when, when you say they definitely have problems, if, you know, I hear some people saying, particularly I, I, they, in Norway, this is practically punctuation. They say, oh, but why are you criticizing China so much? They're raising people out of poverty. That's the same argument that they used in a, an island not too far from Miami where they say, oh, but they give free education. Oh, so just ignore the tens of thousands of people they've murdered and had you know, before a firing squad. Th this, is, this, is not, th we're not, this is not what we're here to engage in. We heard it to provide some actual scientific, and there is a methodology to this. And Javier is, is, is a, 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 a very, very um, uh, articulate, and uh, he has read more books on the subject than pretty much anyone else I know, uh, ranging from economics to social policy. The man has no weekends. It's all he does. <laughs> he, he studies so this we, stuff. We can discuss the specific, oh, okay. the specific, specific cases of Mexico and Uruguay. It's in the report. It's actually in the report. And also the, the South Sudan issues in the report. Yeah, the South, we, we talked about all these things. These, there are some things that are easy. Uh, the four countries we looked at today are easy. There are other countries that are not so simple. South Sudan, you mentioned it's a new country. We actually took that into account. On a strict reading, perhaps their, their, their human rights record is very problematic. They might not qualify. Um, however, their UN voting record is mixed. Um, it, it's, they have not been a leader of negative forces. We put them as questionable and we documented in detail a lot of the problems. So I, I think actually the issue you raised is factored into our report. We have no more time. I uh, just want to thank everyone, thank our speakers who are, who are uh, amazing. And thank, uh, thank all of you who took the time to be with us today. Uh, we appreciate it. Yeah, just give me one second. Just gonna, give me one second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me just say goodbye to people there. The microphone's still on.